I want to tell you a story about reverse engineering and radio waves. Um, stuff was really boring back in like a few months ago. I was sitting at home reading, I don't know, Slashdot or something, and then suddenly these two guys show up, but not on my screen, but actually on my door. And they said they are from the public utility works, and they brought me something magical. Uh, but they said it's something much better than magic, it's actually smart. Um, and then they put a form under my nose and said, sign here. And I said, um, uh, can you show me like some privacy aspects of this device or something? They couldn't, so I said, nah, I can't sign this. So then uh, I felt sudden chill of loneliness. Uh, they were like, the door was slammed shut and I was alone again. No magic was installed in my home. Um, and then I started to think, because I, mm, I was stupid earlier. I have this device in my home. This is from the same vendor. This is a heating uh, magic smart device. Uh, it measures heat in your home. And uh, a few days ago on the crypto, uh, on the cypherpunks mailing list, Grapam said, depending on who owns the meter and the bo box it plugs into, uh, put a Faraday cage around it, don't mess with it, right? I think this is a pretty good advice. Mm, but I have something else as well. Uh, this uh, SDR, uh, RTL SDR stick. And um, I started to look on the internet, what could this be? And Google uh, has this patent database where you can look for patents. So I know who the vendor is of this device, and I start to look um, what could be the technology behind this device so I can like inform myself of the privacy aspects of this magic device that these two uh, guys wanted to install. And I found this, um, this patent, and you don't need to really read it. It's patents, well, you should. <laughs> but uh, some parts were quite interesting. It says the frequency, uh, it also states something about the duty cycle, so this is like very short messages. And the typical message is only 4.1 uh, milliseconds, which will turn out is not quite correct because this pattern describes a different system, but we can uh, expect uh, messages to be sent uh, on 868 megahertz, somewhere around that, which is a, a, a unlicensed spectrum. And, and the packages themselves are pretty short. Okay. So I fire up my RTL SDR, I fire up my favorite SDR software, which is uh, Linrod, and I look at that uh, frequency range. In the middle, this should be uh, 868 megahertz, and a bit left or right to it, depending on where you stand, of course, um, you see there's these lines. Uh, these lines are actually pretty short messages. They look like that. Uh, I could have measured, and I actually did, but I don't have any of those in my screen, in my slideshow, so. Uh, I started to look around even more. So now that I know something about the heating meter that I have, I started to look for, for data sheet. What does the data sheet say? So, Funk uh, 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 Verteiler or something is this FH key V. It's a German name for this device. It does data encoding radio transfer. Um, the interface is interesting because it says it's optical for the TACAM service device. So if you go back to actually this picture of it, you can see this is the input of this device. So that means it is actually not able to receive data from the outside except for uh, from this uh, infra. Uh, input, um, which is interesting. So that means there's no way to communicate with this without me being um, like uh, at least and somewhat in control. Uh, it also specifies uh, the correct uh, frequency, transmitting power, and actually here we see the transmission period is uh, 7.5 milliseconds, a bit longer. So that means maybe there's more data or some different encoding uh, system. Also, the data sheet says something very interesting. I get like fired up. Oh, finally, there will be a cryptographic challenge in this as well. I can be sure there will be, it will be easy to break uh, and there will be still some, something to, to think about. But it sounds, I don't know, crazy a bit. Like, you know, secure data transfer using CRC. Um, hmm. 
so then I, it took me some more weeks to try to mod demodulate these radio waves. Um, I tried a lot of things, uh, mostly with um, um, GNU radio. But then after more Googling, I found, suddenly found this, this draft standard, which is not a draft anymore, but the real standard is not available only if you pay for it um, officially. So I, I downloaded this, this, this draft, and if you look at the um, title of it, it's wireless meter readout for operation in the 868 to 870 MHz SRD band. So this looks like it matches the device that I have. And there's, a, there's an industry standard for, for doing that. It would have been nice if I knew that like a few weeks before, maybe asking the right persons what I have, but like Google or Cirques is also very helpful. So in this document, there's a lot of more interesting data. Again, more precise uh, frequency data and settings, and there's some information that says FSK deviation, so that means uh, what I've been playing with is actually uh, FSK modulated. Uh, what is FSK modulating? Mod modulation, it's a frequency shift keying. This is very simple. Uh, you have the data, you have a sinus wave, you uh, multiply these two together, and then you get either this uh, for ones, or you get this uh, slower frequency for zeros, and so on and so on. This is very simple, and this is the modulation. So you, knowing this and knowing the data, for example, the FSK deviation that is listed in this table, I was able to create a simple GNU radio block, which is really simple. I have a translating filter, some s simple squash, and then I do the quadrature demodulation, which does the FSK demodulation, and then I write this whole thing out into a file. So how does this, uh, okay, well, I did also some more playing, and uh, on the frequency that I am observing, uh, the FFT plot looks very promising. It, it shows you there might be something to catch here. And then if I do this with the demodulation, the, the demodulated signal, this looks like there might be some bits. Of course, the signal is not quite clean yet, uh, but in the later stages, I was able to clean the signal up and dump it like this. If you look at, uh, I hope you can see this also from the back, if you look at the output of uh, this GNU radio block, it is only uh, bytes with the value of one for a very long time. But then if I look for something else, then I will find something around the address, I don't know if you see that, that is hexa 38,590 hex uh, further away from, from the zero offset. So it's really far in. Um, you see there's suddenly zeros appearing and it has like some kind of periodic structure so this is this is good news because that means I, I suddenly am able to at least get some some signal that I can actually understand in in bit form. And um, looking at the standard that I downloaded, it says that in this mode there's a preamble, and then we have in the preamble we have this alternating pattern of ones and zeros which should be at least uh, 19 times appearing, and then it should be finishing off with this pattern of 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1. And these are very special patterns, as we will see in a sec. And if you go back to the hex dump that I, I saw, we can see that indeed we have uh, some kind of like 1, 2, 3, 5 long, uh, a pattern of zeros, then we have one, two, three, four, five again, patterns of ones, uh, one, once again five zeros, then five ones, so that means this looks like, indeed, as if we continue going down, this looks like this alternating pattern of zeros and ones, but a bit more uh, longer, because the sample rate is, of course, bigger, so, so we get the same, um, we get more uh, samples than the signals actually. So we need to, uh, this is also very nice because we know now we can use this for actually detecting and calculating this, the signal uh, free, uh, rate, the data rate. And we can deduce that from the sample rate. But in this case, it was one megahertz per sec. So if we go on, then we can see uh, okay, we have this preamble and we can identify this preamble and then the uh, standard also specified that there's this tree of six data encoding and if I apply this to the bits that follow 
already interpreted uh, with the adjusted sample rate, then I can decode certain f uh, f uh, f groups of four bits into uh, uh, groups of three bits. And uh, actually I did that, and this is what I got as an output. Um, and this looks pretty cool. Actually, if you if you started with you had no clue actually what is flying over the radio waves from your your heating device, eh? um, and actually all the other packets that I decoded from the stream also looked like this. They had if I would have had the flow tools, it would have shown me some patterns that are static uh, in in these in these packets. For example, the length is always the same. I can show you that. And then the standard, of course, uh, um, specifies the length. And if you look at the beginning of the first uh, byte, uh, this should be the length of the packet. And if we verify this length, uh, it actually turns out this uh, is correct. Um, later on, the next field is like a control field, which means that um, uh, this uh, telegram needs not to be answered. Uh, it's simply a notification about the current state. Then you have the manufacturer ID, uh, which is uh, a three-letter ID encoded into two bytes, interestingly. And the code for decoding it is in Python uh, simply like this. Uh, and the output of this decoding is TCH, which uh, looks like it belongs to the manufacturer of the heating meter and of the smart meter that I wanted to install in my uh, bathroom. So, and then there's the six bytes um, that are a vendor specific addressing scheme, but there seems to be also some fields in there that encode, I think, at least the type of what kind of meter this is, maybe a heating meter or the capacity or something like that. I have not been able to completely reverse engineer this format, but um, there seems to be some specific bits at least that have some uh, meaning. This will be interesting to see. And then uh, the next part in the packet is a cyclic redund redundancy check, which I tried to brute force, but then I found it in the standard. So all this what I'm saying that I'm showing you in the standard, most of that has been like sweated over for weeks and found out by myself but later then I found the standard and now I copy the stuff from the standard. So I have also brute forced the, the, the CRC for, for this and I, I like I, I had I, I, uh, I, it uh, test run for at least uh, two days with all kind of parameters being permuted. Um, and then the last byte that the standard specifies is the control information field. And for the value of A0, it says manufacturer specific application layer. Yoo-hoo, so we're out of standards land now. So uh, we can start reverse engineering a bit more again because there's no information on that. Um, of course, well, um, so this is the rest that I have not been able to decode. I, I, incidentally, I use the same format as DNet in his flow tools. The bytes that I know already are dots, and the bytes that I don't know are, well, listed. So this is the last part, or like this is the data or the payload part after the header, but what does it mean? So uh, more dumps, uh, more months of staring at hex dumps ensued, but it was fun times, I tell you. Like so many stuff coded up for, for testing out your, your hypothesis. Um, but um, in the end, I think after capturing a lot of these packets and diffing and, and processing them, um, it seems to me that like the first two, four bytes are some kind of uh, TLV indicator of what kind of data is coming. This seems to be also confirmed by other standards, but I have not been able to identify which part of these standards might be related to these two bytes. But this seems to be some static. In all the packets that I received from the heating meters, these bytes are always the same. Um, <clears throat> this next uh, is, off, is, is seems to be changing, but it seems to be two bytes that are always constant for the same station, for the same meter. I have no idea what this means. Uh, this is the stuff to explore, or maybe someone tells me what this is. Um, the next one is the date, which is a uh, date encoded into two bytes. This is the function how you can 
decode these two bytes into a date, um, actually. So I think this case is like March or something uh, encoding. And it is interesting is that uh, the year is hard coded in the date. Um, so the next two fields is the total consumption since ever this device was started. I was able to deduce that. I will show you my, my little trick uh, in a sec. Um, the next uh, four bytes are actually the, in, the, the heating sensors have two temperature sensors. Uh, one internal and one external, and the difference between two, those two temperatures are used to calculate the costs that you're going to pay for, for the heating. So these are the two um, uh, readings of that sensor, of those two sensors, and interestingly, these two readings, these are not static. Every packet contains the actual current temperature that can be measured in, in this, in this uh, sensor. And this is pretty interesting, I think. Um, uh, the next field in this case uh, is the current uh, consumption in the current bi-weekly cycle, which I will show you uh, in a sec what that means. And uh, this is the consumption in the previous bi-weekly cycle. Uh, and this is some kind of integer, and I guess it's related to like um, temperature divided by square meters or, or cubic meters or something like that. Uh, that should be, I guess, the, the metric that is used here. So where did I get some of the information? I looked at the display. So this device, the heating meter, has a display, and it displays these three uh, information uh, bits. Uh, this is from the data sheet of the device, actually. So you, uh, it displays your current consumption. That should be actually the consumption in the current bi-weekly cycle. Then the reference date consumption is the total consumption you had so far, since the device has been started and there was no rollover yet, I guess. And then the last uh, that it displays is also the device has a serial number. So by looking at this uh, last bit, the serial number, and uh, looking at my device and looking at the packets, I was able to find my own uh, 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 packets that my device is sending out and by finding that I was also uh, able to identify these two numbers in the uh, packet stream. Uh, this would be, this is the total consumption and these, this is the, uh, the value that is displayed here, the current consumption. So this I was able to cro uh, correlate and this helped me into uh, finding out like the first part, so this is like um, around, I don't know, you can count it like 16, 18 bytes or something that I was able to, to reverse engineer by looking at the packets. But the last part of the packets, uh, I had no idea what that is. So if, if you look at the, the end of the packet that I have not been able to decode, it looks like this. And uh, it took me a long time to find out what this is because this part of the packet did not change. I was collecting samples for days and days, and there was no change in the in the part uh, for each station that was sending out these packets. Uh, nothing changed. Like uh, a, pack, uh, a station was sending out this, and then for days it would send out this all the time and nothing else. Eh? So um, this is not a meter, this is not a counter. But uh, the data sheet already, uh, uh, again helps us and it says radio transfer of the mid-month and month-end figures making intermediate on-site meter reading superfluous. So this actually means that this is the current consumption, this is the consumption the two weeks before, this is the consumption the two weeks before that, this is the consumption the two weeks before that, and so on and so on. Here we see this is like winter, here it's cold, and then it gets warmer again, and this is like the summertime. This is no joke, this is really like in the summer there's no heating and there was no need for the heating. Uh, and so if, I, if you look at that, you can also see the patterns, how the families are um, um, heating their, their flats in my uh, neighborhood. Uh, there's, uh, of course, I didn't only catch the uh, heat meter packets, but there was also other devices sending similar packets. In this case, of course, my neighbors had this magic device installed. 
uh, by these two uh, brothers, uh, plumbers. And, and so I was able to capture also that data. And in that case, it's not the last two year, uh, last one year, but only the last 11 months that is being sent uh, in bi-weekly cycles. And as you can see, um, this is the zero because it was installed when I took this measurement only a month ago, this whole meter. So there was nothing else to fill up the history of the, uh, of the, of the smart meter. Uh, and basically I have the same problem again. The first two bytes or the first four bytes, I think this is like a TLV. Um, and then I don't know this, this third uh, double or word. And then we again have a date and then we have uh, the total consumption. Then we have this constant, which I don't understand again. And then we have the current consumption and the uh, previous consumption. And so this is the, the, you can see the water consumption of, of, at least in this case, of one of my neighbors. It is definitely not my meter. Um, but as you can see also, um, the counter in a month or in, in two weeks goes only up to 11. So I guess this is again cubic meters or maybe, uh, hopefully not cubic meters, but some, something less because in two weeks, 11 cubic meters is a bit much, I guess. Eh? Um, uh, maybe it's a big family. I don't know. Um, so, if you if you consider that this counter goes up only rarely, like not even once a day, this is not very granular metering, I guess. So, in the end, my conclusion about this is, uh, from a privacy point of view, the, the the granularity of the consumption is not enough to deduce immediate. Uh, information about uh, you, whether you are at home or not. But I think um, long-term demographic values can be deduced, I think, like how many people might be living there, like on, a, uh, on an average or something. Um, but for the public utilities, this data was already available. Um, in this case, you need to start capturing with an RTLSDR or something uh, the consumption, and then you can, um, like I guess, deduce uh, maybe which of the meters belongs to a family which has small kids because they raise the temperature so the kid doesn't get like you know a cold uh, but otherwise I'm not sure uh, what other information you can deduce immediately and you need to have close proximity for that because uh, at my home I have like 60 neighbors I was able to capture about 40 meters in total so even my range to I guess I can improve with a better antenna or something but um, in the end, the, the range needs to be pretty close. So in this case, I think uh, the privacy concerns are at, at only at least moderate, but not very high. So the, the interesting corner case that I think is the temperature values that get transmitted because they are immediate. And uh, it would be interesting to see if my presence in a room can be read out by the fluctuations of the outside reading of the outside temperature sensor. This is something that I will like play with in the future, I guess, uh, maybe. Um, and then I think from remote attack point of view, you know, you know SCADA, up cyber, scare stuff. In this case, I think it's pretty hard to, you have to get these uh, Mario Bros at my door with an infra uh, programming device to, I don't know, reprogram my um, my readers, so I don't, I don't think this is uh, cause for much concern. So, of course, your neighbors they can read the stuff if they download the stuff from GitHub um, that I have published. But um, I'm not, I don't think this is, this is so far uh, the results that I have reading out from this is of not much concern, I think. So um, from my own work, I think lots of that that I found out is already documented. I just messed up the order of finding and re uh, the documentation and fiddling with the stuff. Um, I think the application specific parts will be still interesting because I still haven't found out all of the uh, bytes and, and fields that I have in there. And 
in the end, I was also able to uh, find a shop where you can buy such a reading meter uh, second hand, so you can uh, actually play with this. But for me, since I'm surrounded with all these meters, I need to find a place where I actually do not affect the other meters and only affect the one that I want to play with. Um, and then, of course, also the collecting devices would be interesting because those um, I can feed input in. Because if I have an SDR, I can also like create packets and and and. Uh, send packets at, at the collection devices. But for that, I, I guess I'm not going to mess with those that are installed in my house, but I, I, I guess I should buy some from this uh, uh, second-hand shop. So whoever wants to play with this, uh, first of all, I published all the code that I wrote and the GNU radio uh, blocks on GitHub under my S meter, uh, under my account on S meter project. Uh, I also wrote a, a C-based uh, um, decoder or, uh, for the lower level physical layer, uh, which is pretty fast because I was very um, um, disappointed about the Python parser, which is pretty slow. And so there's the C and there's this Python interpreter for, for, this, uh, for the heat meters and for the for the uh, water meters. And then there's a, <coughs> actually, there's a GNU radio um, block that actually speaks this protocol. It's called VM, WM bus. Um, it does also only the uh, lower physical layer. And uh, some of the parts have been bit rotten away. So I have some contributions in there that make it work with the latest GNU radio if you want to play with this as a GNU radio block instead of the stuff that I mixed up um, on GitHub myself. So, and this is my final slide and I hope you liked this little story and if you have any questions, please bring it up. Yes? Yes. So, so what is the role of the The what? The ah, okay. So the question was that uh, the device sends out these packets periodically. Yes. Um, and there was a second part of the question, what the uh, role of the infrared receiver is. So the infrared receiver is for starting and maintenance for, for the ma maintenance personnel, for setting up, starting, resetting. So you need physical contact with this. Uh, so this is how you program this device. And um, the messages get sent. Um, I think the total sending time is 3.6 seconds in an hour of course, because it's a 1% uh, duty cycle. So that means uh, if you calculate 7.5 milliseconds, uh, how many times that fits into 3.6 seconds, you will find out there's like, I don't know, 30 or something packets being sent an hour by each device. And I have like, I don't know, 500 dev uh, devices in my vicinity, out of which I, I can receive like 40 to 50. So, uh, and all these 50, as you, I can show you this picture again. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, if you see this picture, I don't know how well you see it from there, but these are very uh, thin lines. And this is the 7.5 milliseconds that uh, our device is actually transmitting. And because I have so many devices in my vicinity, I have so many messages. And this is also what you can see here. They have different transmission powers that, or uh, the power that I receive with. And so that also means they are more farther away or more closer or whatever, right? So this, this is how I can see. And there's almost continuously uh, transmission going on, but it's always a very different device that is uh, sending a packet. And it's like a random message, uh, random timing or something that is being used. Uh, not quite, but... Please. Uh have you read anything about the power supply of this stuff? Yes, uh, the, uh, the question was if I have read anything about the power supply. Yes, the power supply seems to be a battery and it uh, internally in the device and it is good for 10 years. 
and I guess it affects the transmission power. This is why the range is from 3 milliwatts to 10 milliwatts, because I guess at the end it's much lower, the transmission power, I guess. Yes? So uh, I guess you, the DC license will have a very power range. No. So uh, how does the circuit connect to the station? Ah, OK. This is excellent. OK. So since the question was, since these devices have not a big range, how is this being collected? Um, this is what the patent is about, actually. Um, the way it works, you have uh, a redundant array of collection devices. So you have at least two collection devices, which are also like a protection against tampering or something. Uh, but the, the specification says about uh, at least two collection devices per 500 uh, meter devices. Uh, the more you have, the bigger your range is of these collection devices, because then you have like more collection devices across a building, and then the far away uh, meters can reach that one, uh, but they cannot reach the other one. And the collection devices themselves, they also broadcast this data to each other. And they replicate all the incoming data to each other so that all the data that is received by the far one is also in the near one stored. Uh, and that's basically it. And I think the whole thing works on the speculation that during a whole month, when you have like hourly a few dozen attempts at these uh, transmissions, some of them will go come true and can be received. And apparently it works, I guess. Yes, someone has to go. I don't. Uh, that is an uh, interesting question. If these collection devices are collect, uh, connected to the internet, as far as I can uh, guess, I would say there's someone coming with a reader device, which is a radio, and reading it out from these devices. Uh, and as far as I understood, it is actually a car that is just driving by and reading it out. They don't have to come in at all. Um, this is what the specification says, but I have not been able to find any of the radio signals related to that. But I'm looking for them. So there is maybe not such a big privacy problem, but there is a security problem because it seems very easy to forge. Oh yes. Oh yes. Oh yes. So the privacy problem, the, the question is there's no privacy problem, but there's a security problem because it's easy to forge. Indeed. It looks like it is very easy to forge. The thing is, actually, the protocol specifies it in a way that um, the first message that is received by a collection device is uh, stored, and then later on it is verified that it's always the same message or not lower or something. So if you're able to block the, with the Faraday cage, for example, the original signal, you can uh, actually send signals that are getting built to your neighbor's device or something like that. That, indeed, is a security problem in this case, yes. You can block it, but you can do everything that you can do with radios, right? And as you can see, there was absolutely no encryption in, like, only CRC, but that's not encryption. This Um, the question is whether the service provider is periodically physically checking and verifying these devices. I don't know, so far not. And um, the only thing that they, well, they can check these devices, but like my, my, my water meter, they only check when the, the lifetime expires and then they replace it and then they check that the plums and stuff, the seals are still intact. But nothing else. So I don't. I, I, well, if they suspect something, they might verify it, of course. But how do you? But then they can identify How do you? And I, this is uh, you cannot really identify the forging of these. You it is. Of course, I can. I can simply send the same packet that I need, want to send yeah, out. 
Yes, but I blocked uh, the physical device and it cannot send out anything and I will replace that. I will play a man in the middle or something or like impersonation actually. Ah, in the they will read it out from the device. Yeah, well, that's something that you need to take care of, I guess. <laughs> Also, I was thinking about the method that they use to determine how much you use your radiators. And uh, it's interesting because th this means that you can just use low tech methods to ensure that the temperature difference between the outer and inner sensors is not that big. There is actually mention of uh, temper blah against exactly this kind of attack. It says that if, the, if, if, if it senses something fishy about this internal external temperature measurement, it switches to internal measurement only. But how, on what conditions this depends and what it mitigates and how it is not documented, I don't know that. But there is there's explicit mention of this one whatever defense. Sorry, what? The what? But the, yeah. the other thing for you can also do like a um, uh, an attack on your neighbors by not making you pay less, but making your neighbor pay more. And it will be his device that is being tampered with, and he will have trouble. And you can even call the public utility on it. Hey, I think this guy is cheating on you, <laughs> or something like that, right? So, man, if you don't like your your your, I don't know, neighbor, this is also something that you can play. Like you or know, if my neighbor doesn't like me. I'm yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. So it's a digital swatting. Yes, <laughs> yes, the dumb meter swatting. <laughs> Okay, thank you then.